Yeah. Okay. Thank Wonderful. you guys so much for allowing me to disrupt your file. <laughs> I want to thank first uh, Dr. Jasmine Diab and as well as uh, Dr. Najis Kanafe. I'm not sure I'm saying her name. Yes, so I actually at New York University in Toronto for inviting me to come. I'm so excited to be back in Beirut. I lived here for many years and did part of my undergrad at AUB. Um, and I'm so happy to be I took a small walk in your beautiful campus and I'm really impressed with it. So I'd love to come back and even just for lunch here. Uh, I also want to note that in these genocidal times, when and I know you're living through a very difficult time in Lebanon with the threat of violence, I really want to thank you also for taking the time to think with me when you might have more urgent matters that are very understandable as well. Um, I'm going to share some slides while I talk. Oh. <laughs> So on a June morning in 2020, an unusual sight interrupted traffic at the busy roundabout by the Madhav in Beirut when a group of Sudanese men came marching through car lanes. Onlookers who poked their heads outside car windows could hear the man chant, Sudan Obas, Rashin Rashin, we want to go home, we are returning. The protesters carried banners with images of the director of Lebanon's general security, and they gathered in front of general security's headquarters. One of the protesters, who was nicknamed Usher, pulled out a piece of paper and he began to read from it. Addressing the Lebanese authorities, he said, for weeks we have been waiting outside the Sudanese embassy in order to practice our right of return. In his speech, Osher made a double address that signified the protesters' predicaments as being both migrant workers in Lebanon and exiled citizens of Sudan. I'm going to talk about this predicament. First, he called on Amil Am to lift the exit fees that you might know about this that are imposed on migrants who either lack papers or who have overstayed their visa, so they have to pay an exit fees to, to leave the country. Secondly, he called on the Sudanese embassy to supply a charter flight to bring them home to Sudan. He described the present predicament uh, conditions in Lebanon as harsh and inhuman. As I learned through conversations with the protesting migrants, most of them have been out of work for over a year. You note the date of this was July 2020, and some had never found a job in Lebanon in the first place. Unable to pay the return ticket and the ex exit fees, they were left stranded, al in, as they told me. They were not alone in this predicament. By this time, as you may know, thousands of migrant workers were fleeing Lebanon's economic collapse, having lost either their jobs or the value of their income, like their Lebanese counterparts. So what began as a humanitarian crisis, when employers of Ethiopian migrant women dumped them in front of the embassy in Hasmia, unable to afford their labor anymore, soon turned into a political demand. The migrants wanted to go home. Here we go. African migrant workers organized sit-ins in front of the embassies across the city that summer, with several hundred sleeping there on any given night, providing mutual aid and childcare for one another while waiting for a passage home. And Sudanese migrants soon joined this wave of movement building, and they set up camp in front of the embassy in Hamra. This is the Sudanese, uh, and this is from the Kenyan. For or Sierra Leone, I think actually. For any migrant worker in Lebanon, staging a protest in broad daylight is a bold act. The, the embassy sit-ins went beyond that as they confronted multiple state regimes that each have disciplined them either as migrants or as exiled citizens. So it was a political demand that went beyond the migrant labor predicament. In response to the Sudanese migrant sit-in, the embassy announced in a statement issued shortly after the protest that I showed you in the beginning, in which it recognized the challenges facing the Sudanese stranded in Lebanon, and in, again using the same terms that the migrants had used about themselves. And it wrote that it go ahead negotiated with Lebanese authorities in order to lift the exit fees. Meanwhile, they wrote or stated, because Lebanon had refused Sudanese airlines from landing on its strip, landing strip, 
uh, which the Sudanese government would otherwise happily have provided, migrants unfortunately had to sponsor their own flights home, and the nation would welcome them upon their voluntary return. This latter point was bad news for migrants, for whom a ticket home had become unaffordable. So while they waited for an alternative way out, their sit-in grew, and their predicament only worsened, of course, after August 4th, when many lost their homes and joined those sleeping on the street. So the sit-in became a sort of shelter, an open-air shelter for migrants after the explosion. Up to several hundred thousand migrant workers in Lebanon, not counting Syrian and Palestinian refugees, of course, which would uh, lead to millions, at least 15,000 of them are Sudanese, ac accounting for about 9% of the migrant population. These are numbers from IOM from last year. Um, so while they aren't the majority, a few obvious characteristics, characteristics uh, distinguish the Sudanese uh, migrant population. First, whereas as you probably know, the majority of migrant workers in Lebanon are female. Um, the Sudanese migrant community is male dominated. This has to do with uh, a law that dates back to the Islamist regime in Sudan that um, prevented uh, women from traveling without a sponsor, without a family uh, member and so on. And this has made it very difficult for female migrants to leave Sudan. Nevertheless, Sudanese migrant women have joined uh, the, the, this male populated uh, community mostly in recent years. And I'm happy to go further into how that works um, because it's kind of a special legal case. We can talk about that in the question section. So first of all, the Sudanese are mostly men, whereas the rest of the migrant populations are mostly women. Secondly, whereas most of the migrant workers in Lebanon have arrived since the civil war on kafala contracts, which probably is how you're familiar with them. Sudanese workers started coming to Lebanon in the 50s, not earlier, and they were recruited directly by the employers through uh, networks, kinship networks. So if your uncle had worked here, you would uh, follow him. Uh, so the agencies were not involved back then, and it wasn't kafala sponsorship as we know it today. So that's the other um, sort of characteristic now, migrant workers in Lebanon have organized political campaigns in the public before, before this event, most visibly on the annual Migrant Workers May Day. But the embassy sit-ins marked the first time that African and also some Asian migrant workers became vis visible to a Lebanese public as political subjects on their own terms, rather than as an extension of the Lebanese household and service economy. What I mean by this is that they made a demand not as workers in Lebanon, but as exiled citizens. They were not demanding labor rights in this sit-in, but their right of return, gesturing to a transnational geography of political belonging. Of course, we are more familiar with the right of return discourse from the Palestinian question, and I will be also mapping back to that at the end of my talk. So, if, for example, in the Sudanese embassy at sit-in, they didn't articulate a, a direct reference to the Palestinian diasporic demand for a right of return. Um, nevertheless, this, this term was invoked in their interrelated history. So due to the nature of the demand, each migrant group organized on their own um, and they negotiated with Amlam on their own. So each, each migrant group did not get the same deal, so to speak, okay? But even though they organized by a national identity, they also saw their causes united and they extended support between the different citizens. Uh, for example, the Ethiopian migrant left community, Enya Lenya, the collective, they raised their own money for repatriation and supported tickets as well for other migrant women and families, including Sudanese families. Um, and even though the Sudanese citizen was male led uh, and male dominated, women also traveled home on this campaign. And they drew on practices of co-survival between them. Um, so, for example, janitors who lived uh, close to the embassy opened their homes to let the protesting migrant shower and rest there. Uh, and other pools their mutual aid savings to bring food to the sit-in. But ultimately, they relied on funding from private do donations uh, and from Lebanese and international NGOs and activists to raise funds. And every week that fall of 2020, you would see groups of hundreds of migrants lining up in Hariri Airport, turning the, the airport into quite a bustling space of migrants saying hello and goodbye, like in this picture. Um, so migrants did not take to the streets in a vacuum this year. 
So in the summer of 2019, going back one year, preceding the Lebanese October uprising, Palestinian refugee workers, as you may know, held strikes across the camps that summer against labor discrimination. Also preceding the Lebanese uprising, which I will come to, in September 2019, a group of Sudanese and Eritrean asylum seekers had mobilized the Sidon in front of the UNHCR to demand their applications for resettlement to Europe uh, be reopened. And maybe you're familiar with Maya Yanmer's uh, work on this. Um, while this was also Sudanese-led and therefore can, it can be confusing, uh, the asylum seekers in this sit-in in front of UNHCR organized a ver around a very different political subject position than the migrant workers in front of the embassy. So I just think distinguish quite hardly between the two, because they're two different political causes and different different political demands. So this one called for resettlement, okay? Whereas the embassy called for right of return, as I've mentioned. So in the latter one, they were not organizing as refugees, but and they were also not organizing as workers, but as exiled citizens or muhtaribin. Meanwhile, the lack of an identifi identifiable humanitarian claim for the embassy sit-in uh, combined with it being male-led, placed the embassy protesters in a more precarious political position. These are pictures that I took from the um, Sudanese embassy sit and these are some of the sort of slogans they had. On this question of being in a more precarious political position, a Kenyan migrant worker, a female Kenyan migrant worker, told me, no one cares for the male child. They tell the boys, you're a man, be strong. She made this in reference to this um, male that sit in, which she said had been neglected by the Lebanese public. Her observation of the public's gendered sympathy evokes a codification that we're familiar with in humanitarian law and practice that privileges the female sexed subject, while the male heterosexual or assumed heterosexual migrant is less eligible for humanitarian care, even though, of course, women and women identified migrants do face other risks. So there's a reason for this, but nevertheless, the, the Kenyan woman saw that her own, uh, maybe you saw this in, if you were around Badaru in 2020, after the explosion, you, you might have seen Kenyan women sleeping on the street in the middle of bars and people passing by. So their embassy sitting, because of the location of their embassy, gained a lot more attention and, and sort of public disgrace because of women and children sleeping in the middle of the streets and being subject to harm from onlookers as well as police, uh, a lot of police violence. So a similar empathy that this Kenyan migrant worker gave to her Sudanese colleagues was also evoked by, uh, in the, in the, by the diaspora of Sudanese as well as in Sudan. So for example, as you may know, and we'll talk more about this, there was a revolution ongoing in Sudan at the time and the Sudanese Translators for Change, which is a pro-revolution network that became big in the revolution, tweeted, bring our children back in reference to this sit-in. So meanwhile, uh, this paternalist identification, again, of the male migrant worker as a child and a child of the nation, nonetheless, uh, contrasts quite notably with the expectations that are placed on male migrants as being proud family providers and not in need of care. So here you see how the migrant worker in need becomes awkwardly positioned between the revolutionary citizen who sort of represents national labor struggles, which they were excluded from, and the international refugee who can claim a clear humanitarian protection, which they also could not because they were asking to go home. This binary, okay, between the worker and the refugee in which the migrant worker is awkwardly positioned, uh, was evoked by several migrant workers that I spoke to that summer. One, Abdul Raif, I'm going to mention a couple of names, so just for warning you so it doesn't get confusing. Uh, a young Dafuri migrant, he said, we're not revolutionaries, nor are we refugees. We're just stranded at the same time. He emphasized that there's nothing revolutionary about begging the regime to take us back. So he was crit critical of the sit-in. And he expressed an overall sense of political hopelessness at this time, a sense of being stranded in the presence, we may say. His friend, Walid, who was a bit older than him, agreed. The three, the three of us were having coffee and we had just passed by the sit-in. And he said, we're not revolutionaries here. We're just foreigners, workers without rights. 
The guys used slogans from the Sudanese revolution, but this is wrong. The sit-in was not caused by the revolution in Sudan. It was caused by Lebanon's crisis. So here he referred to the slogans that the sit-in had adopted from the ongoing revolution in Sudan. So the, the, migrant, the Sudanese migrants in Beirut were making a sort of direct reference to what was going on in Sudan. For example, chanting, Ehna thuwar min kamal al mishwar but the, um, the guys who did not join their fellow Sudanese at the sit-in said, this is kind of empty talk. I want to note in this context that both of the people who were, uh, several people who were critical of the sit-in, who had grown up in Darfur, uh, where they had been fled and their families have been fleeing wars raged by the regime in Sudan. And so they did not have any um, path home, let's say, return was not safe for them. Another, yet another migrant called Abdallah, I'm using, by the way, acronyms here, I'm not using the real names, uh, a Dafuri migrant uh, told me something similar. And he's, he's made a very uh, interesting argument, so I want to just uh, emphasize that a bit. He had himself been at the forefront of um, a solidarity march that the Sudanese migrants had made the year earlier with the revolution in Sudan. Um, but in this, but in this sit-in, uh, he stayed away. And then I, when I asked him why, why he didn't join like this ongoing action, he said, we're workers without voice and rights, similar to how I had heard this discourse from, from fellow Sudanese. But then he elaborated, he said, in Lebanon, we Sudanese enjoy life. We can eat and drink. What right do we have to ask the regime to help us get home? The sit-in didn't accomplish anything political. The regime doesn't care about us. I want to unpack a little bit his discourse here. He articulated first the tension between being a migrant and an exiled citizen. So in the Sudanese in Lebanon are workers without rights. That's his first observation. But in Beirut, they live and have access to pleasures of consumption in contrast to the communities they left behind in Darfur in particular. Now, of course, those consumption levels have been drastically declined by the crisis in, in Lebanon, but still he made a comparison where he said, we're relatively privileged here. His recognition of that privilege and perhaps a sense of guilt towards home were closest than any claim he may entertain in relation to the Sudanese state. He says, we have no right to ask them to help us, okay, because we chose to go here. But even if they did claim a right, this is the irony of his speech, the regime wouldn't listen because they don't care about us. And this last point is striking because not only does it contradict what the Sudanese embassy had declared in the statement I showed you, where they spoke to the migrants as if they were children of the nation in need of their care, sort of paternalist governing body. Um, it also reveals a position of being doubly dispossessed and expendable. So they're workers without rights in Lebanon, which it's true by law here, and citizens in Sudan whom the state does not care about. And this renders their claims irrelevant in both contexts. This is not my argument, but this is what he thought. Okay, of course in Lebanon, migrants are not the only workers without rights, as we know very well. Lebanese national workers too have been struggling to feed their families since the crisis began in 2019. And the spontaneous nationwide general strike that emerged in October 2019 united around the twin demand, which I don't think I have to tell you guys, but to fix the sovereign debt crisis and to end the sectarian system that has been governing since the, the civil war. And as you probably also know, if you joined the, the, the strike, it, was, um, it, it used a very unique tactic of road blocking across the country to motivate these demands. And this was because it was not a union backed uh, strike. So usually if it's union backed, you don't need to do that. But in this case, it was civilian led without unions. And this actually enabled a spontaneous cross class solidarity characterized by what some people have argued is a politics of presence or a commitment of showing up. But not every presence was well, equally welcomed at the general strike in 2019. For example, the Lebanese army were profiling Palestinians and excluding them from entering protest areas. Still, many Palestinians and as well as Syrians did join the, the Lebanese protests. And in fact, Syrian migrant workers tragically were the first to be martyred in Lebanon's uprising when two Syrian construction workers were burned alive while sleeping inside a construction building 
uh, that was set on fire by protesters on October 17 in downtown Beirut. Of course, the protesters were unaware that there were workers sleeping inside this building, so this is not a cause of uh, of protest or violence. It's a cause of, of employer neglect and it sort of reveals the exploitation and neglect of this whole system. Um, but it was ne ne nevertheless a tragic and notable event. So these pictures are from feminist led uh, and anti racist led protests in the uprising. Okay, this, this picture, the other picture is uh, a call made with the from between the Sudanese and the Lebanese uprising. So, despite these efforts of solidarity, okay, between migrant labor and, and feminist Lebanese feminist uh, demands, and with, between like transnational solidarity, many African migrant workers in Lebanon told me that they felt excluded from the Lebanese uh, general strike, and they didn't define identify with its demands or with the, the larger demands of the Lebanese uprising. So, I want to want to move us towards that now. Okay, I'm moving backwards in time to sort of create a genealogy of political actions that happened between 2019 and 2020. So, as I mentioned, the Lebanese strike used very creatively roadblocks, but this also blocked people from reaching work. And so some migrant workers who were not protected by the law uh, associated these roadblocks with as the main obstacle to their livelihood. Why? So they lost their jobs because they couldn't get to work because of the strike rather than seeing the reason for the uprising as the corrupt regime that they themselves were uh, victims of, we can say. So I'll give you an example of someone who didn't feel included in this uprising. Uh, Musa, a young migrant worker from Western Sudan, had lost his job in an office in downtown Beirut during the crisis. He could no longer afford his rent in Beirut, so he, was, uh, he moved to Saida, where he got uh, a job at a potato chip factory and he was working the night shifts. He was responsible for registering productivity, so workers coming in and out, and he worked 13 hours a day around, uh, in, um, and for nothing, as he complained, in reference to the devastation of the currency, right? Because he was paid in lira. Meanwhile, in Saida, he shared a room with other Sudanese male workers, and I visited them um, on a Sunday off, where several had worked night shifts. This is really, Typical, by the way, that Sudanese men will live together and cook together and care for each other, which is something we can talk more about. Um, and I showed up to eat lunch with them. They were cooking asida, which is the Sudanese starch. When I asked Musa and his uh, roommates why they did not organize to protest their labor conditions, of course, this was a naive question, willfully so. He said, it's a cold topic. I'll do about it. There's no revolution for us as foreigners. We can only think of our own survival. And his roommates agreed. One person that I will call Izzo said, there would never be a protest at the factory to begin with because no one would join it. So these workers, they, these migrants worked to survive, but in so doing, they faced a contradiction. As migrants in Lebanon, they labor like workers, but they do not they're not considered workers by the law or politically or even arguably in social terms, they're not considered workers. The legal privileging of partisan sectarian membership since the Civil War, um, as well as the exclusion of migrant workers from that membership, political partisan membership, which is uh, sort of sectarian based, has made it arguably impossible for migrant workers to really engage in Lebanese national labor struggles. And in 2020, this, the, the migrant action of, of calling for their right of return and calling for, um, calling for their um, voluntary repatriation uh, suggests that the struggle to survive Lebanon's crisis has pushed them past any aspiration they may have otherwise entertained for recognition and integration as workers in Lebanon. They were not anymore asking to get in, but to be let out. Now, I don't, I'm not saying that this is general. Like, I'm not saying that migrant workers historically and always will never be able to participate in national labor struggles. But I'm saying that in this moment of crisis, when Lebanon was facing a collapse, political, economic, and social, it is interesting to note that the way migrant workers were organizing was not to be included in this ongoing political moment, actually, in Lebanon, but to leave. Now, some assumptions, sorry, this is a little 
subsumption of migrants into a national labor class agenda that we sometimes tend to do, I think, at least scholars tend to do this. We want to include migrants in the idea of the working class. It sometimes fails to grasp the other political demands and practices and histories that migrants bring with them and which like continue to grow in the diaspora, right? So any migrant worker community here is also a diasporic community and we have to keep that in mind. And that's what I want to talk about. For example, in the 70s and 80s, Beirut was home to transnational solidarity demands that united Palestinians, Eritreans, Sudanese, Sri Lanki, and other, other foreigners in liberation struggles that were enabled by their presence here together in Beirut, but then it transcended Lebanese national borders. For example, many African migrant workers led sort of double lives where they were cleaning homes and cooking by day. And by night, they were organizing as political citizens elsewhere. So I'll give you an example. This is the picture of the founding members of the Sudanese Cultural Club taken in 1967. The Cultural Club still exists in Hamra. And this is an honorary certificate for an Eritrean woman by the Eritrean People's Liberation Front, thanking her for her service to the liberation struggle of Eritrea. She was serving for the EPLF while being a migrant worker here since the 70s. And she, her employer never knew about it. And I'm sharing this, trying to hide her name just to be a little discreet about that. Okay, can you see who this is? The person in the middle? The non-Sudanese person? Uh, uh, Prime Minister? Salim al exactly. So there's some, so wait a bit. Okay. I, so here, so I mentioned earlier that agencies were not responsible for bringing migrants back then. Okay. This becomes important at this moment. So in the civil war still, agencies were starting to recruit migrant workers, but there was, it wasn't still, Kafala sponsorship was not like ratified or standardized. Okay. So it was a more flexible time. And this photo marks a, tr a certain transition in migrant labor history. I'm quite proud of that. This photo. So around 1990, the date is a little suspect, but it was during one of his, Salim al served multiple terms at the end of the Civil War, and this was one of them. So in 1990, the arrival of 50 Sudanese migrants uh, to Lebanon at the, at the, by the border uh, caused a newspaper in Sudan to, write, to make a cover story in which they warned, the Sudanese in Beirut face problems of a new kind. The Syrian border control had confiscated their passports. This is not a dramatic story today, Mohek. Through employer connections, the Sudanese club, which I showed you before, had organized a meeting with Salim al Hos, who agreed to return these migrants' passports directly. So this form of direct political negotiation by a top, in fact, prime minister, and his attention, I'm not saying he's a hero, but his, his, in this moment, his attention to individual <laughs> migrants' legal issues, and I'll, we'll go back to this, uh, why he, why was he attending this meeting? So he showed up at the club and negotiated with them on the basis of just 50 migrant workers who had been detained, okay? This is unimaginable today, right? Absolutely unimaginable. Um, and there, I think there are two, two reasons. One is, of course, that, I mean, as a top Sunni elite politician who also had private connections with Sudanese, he also had an interest in supporting what he saw as a pan-Arab workers association, right? Because the Sudanese were considered pan-Arab, and so they were part of that struggle. And many had uh, previously perhaps expressed a certain solidarity with that side of the war. But the other thing is that there wasn't, it, there wasn't this idea of Amal Am at the time, right? So now you saw in the beginning that Amal Am is the sort of the location for migrant struggle. And, but this, back then you would, lose, you would use personal connections. So, he had a Sudanese working in his house, and that's how it, he ended up here. I'm oh, so sorry to interrupt you. But for those of you breaking your fast, if you want to have a snack set on for a minute, please feel free to do that. Yes, we do. And I've almost done that. So please take your time, but you know, yeah, it's to, otherwise, please do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So not here, I think anyone here, just marking that this is a very unusual political encounter. Um, and it's also marked a generational change. So from these, uh, by the way, this person is one of my main interlocutors in my project. His name is Idris Ali. Uh, 
And uh, he ha he's like a complete political history book. If you ever want to talk to him, he knows every Nepalese politician. It's absolutely crazy. This is just any day for him in the war. Um, so his experience of migration is very different from young migrants who come today and who face a much more precarious and, and hardened uh, migrant economy around, especially around how the law treats them. So we can we, maybe we can go back to that because I think that's more the reality that that you guys are familiar with. Okay. Migrant workers exceed the category of migrant labor. In many ways, I've tried to show some of the ways that this became apparent in Lebanon's general strike and economic crisis. So when migrant workers experienced being stranded, they found a way out by amplifying another political belonging as citizens back home. And this claim articulated a, a political critique of Lebanon's labor regime uh, through the refusal to stay part of it at any costs but it also articulated a demand for citizen rights in Sudan. So the sit-in revived an expert citizen political imaginary that had been boosted by the ongoing revolution in Sudan. And now I want to move us towards Sudan. This actually is an iconic image. I mean, I took this image, it's not iconic from, from my, uh, but the bridge, and um, maybe Jenny can speak more to this, but uh, this bridge became very uh, important in the revolution. And it's also a tragic place where the army through several protesters in the water who drowned. And the, this tower is a gift from, I mean, that's what he calls it from, it's called the Gaddafi Tower, and it was uh, recently bombed in the war. So, yeah. Um, so by the time that many Sudanese migrants returned to Sudan, the families were struggling with the rising costs of living amid a transitional period in Sudan that wasn't going so well, let's put it just in these terms. And uh, for example, there was a cut to basic subsistence goods, so it became very very expensive to, 